Good morning. I'm Pastor Lolita Cowles. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at Madisonville First United Methodist Church, and I love the sound of tromping children, don't you? Um, and so, so thankful for what God is doing here in this place and what God continues to do. We've been in a sermon series the last few weeks called uh, Messy, uh, where we've been looking at some of the messy scriptures in the Gospel of John in ways that Jesus has uh, either you know, gets in some dirty situations, but, and first week we talked about Jesus riding in the dust, last week we talked about Jesus making mud, um, and today we're moving away from dirt and mud into a stinky situation that Jesus is in. Uh, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John just a portion of, about the death of Lazarus, and as what we're going to read today, the death of Lazarus was not the end of the story. So we read now from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we read your word and we are astounded by what your son is able to do. We are. And we're thankful that we indeed serve a God who can do anything. Help us to believe that again today. To trust you. To get bigger eyes, a better imagination, to embrace all the possibilities that you indeed offer to us. Help us to seek you and to trust you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So I just have to tell you, I really love me some sassy Jesus. I love it. Now, I love Jesus in general, okay? I really love Jesus. But there's something about this interaction with Martha that just makes me love how he specializes in pointing out the obvious to people in very frank and honest ways. When Martha tries to remind Jesus that her brother's body has been in the grave for four days, and that removing the stone from the grave, well, that is going to release the smell of his decaying body in all of, his full, in all of its fullness. Jesus looks at her and says, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see God's glory? Didn't I tell you? Now, Jesus is referring to an earlier conversation he had with Martha. The account of the death and resurrection of Lazarus takes up a whole chapter in the Gospel of John, the whole of chapter 11. It's a beautiful, amazing story. I recommend go and read it this afternoon because it's powerful reading. But he's referring back to a conversation that Scripture accounts for that, he ha that Jesus had with Martha, and it was going to have happened just within hours before this happening. And yes, this is the same Martha that Jesus chastised for being upset with her sister Mary, who was sitting and listening at Jesus' feet instead of helping her with the chores. 
Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus, they were good friends and faithful followers of Jesus. And so when Lazarus became ill, his sister sent word to Jesus for him to come. But Jesus waited a couple of days, and by the time he made it to Bethany, which is the town that they lived in, by the time he arrived, Lazarus had been dead for four days, and he was buried. Martha came out to meet Jesus when she heard that Jesus was coming. She actually went out on the road and met him along the way, and she confronted Jesus about not coming more quickly and even naming, you know what, Lazarus wouldn't have died if you had been here. She tells him that. Now, this might seem a little rude on Martha's part. You can really tell they were friends here. It might have seemed rude on Martha's part to name this to Jesus, but actually in the confrontation that she has and the conversation that followed between her and Jesus, Martha displays a remarkable faith. As their conversation unfolds, Martha goes on to say that even though Jesus wasn't there, even though he wasn't, she knows that whatever he asks of God, God will do it. She knows this. And Jesus then goes on to tell her, your brother will rise again. He will. She responds back, well, I, I do believe that he's going to rise again in the resurrection of the last day. She believes her brother is going to live again, but not until God has made all things whole. And then Jesus tells her, and I hope you've heard what Jesus is about to tell her. Jesus tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? He asks her that. And Martha in one of the most profound and boldest statements of faith, says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha tells Jesus this. I believe you are. I believe. Martha had a deep and abiding faith that Jesus was the Messiah, the one by whom all things would be made whole. She believed Jesus when he told her that he was the resurrection and the life, that those who believe in Christ will live even though they die, and that death was not the end of the story for those who follow him. She believes this. Yet not much later, what does she do? She tries to stop the Messiah, the Son of God, from removing the stone from in front of her brother's tomb. And this is when Jesus pulls out the sass. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see God's glory? Did I not tell you who I was? Did I not tell you what I can do? Did I not tell you that whoever believes in me will live though they die? Didn't I tell you? Jesus was going to fulfill his promise to Martha that he was the resurrection and the life, but he was going to do this in such a way that she couldn't even begin to imagine because Jesus promised, and Jesus always keeps his promises. Too often it is us who struggle with when and how those promises are fulfilled. Too often it is us when faced with the prospect of restoration, though we may want it now, we place restoration so often in the realm of one day that it will happen, but Probably not today. Martha only had the long view of restoration in mind. 
which is why she questioned Jesus about his order to remove the stone from in front of the tomb. She wanted Jesus to remember that, you know, my brother really is dead. Because he was. He wasn't having a four-day-long nice nap. He was dead, and it stunk. Stunk, literally and figuratively, stunk. But Jesus knew this. He knew Lazarus was dead. Jesus himself had shed tears over the death of his friend. Martha didn't have to remind him about the stench of death that was going to overwhelm everyone there, himself included, when that stone was rolled away. The obvious pain and brokenness of death was on full display, and it was not to be avoided. Yet in Jesus' response to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see God's glory? Jesus is also pointing out to her that he's about to blow her mind. He is. He was going to surpass the boundaries of possibility that she and others had set. She was about to see her brother restored to life before her very eyes. And yes, the overwhelming smell of death would be there, but it was going to be a reminder to them that this restoration was real. So real. That Jesus was going to bring new life out of the very real reality of death and decay. That Jesus could do this because he was the resurrection and the life, both in the present and in the future. And that this action is a witness to God's glory and power. God's glory and power at work to bring restoration of life. That was not just some future promise to be fulfilled, but it's a promise that could be realized right now. That new life, it's real and it's available to be lived now. And that restoration, this is a work of God. And God would do it in the way that God wants, and when God wants, to whom God wants. Now, restoration is a general concept. That doesn't really sound too messy of a gig, right? Except if you think about, maybe if you're remodeling something, so you got some dust and dirt that get in the way if you're doing that. But overall, wouldn't you agree that restoration is something that people long for? People want, they, they desire it? Things being made right, healing happening in people's lives, a painful situation being resolved, hope that things can be different. We all have things in our life and people we know that long for some kind of restoration. But it's not that restoration in and of itself can be messy, but it's because we struggle with restoration. That's what makes it messy. We struggle with, is it really possible now for a multitude of reasons? It's messy because it doesn't happen on our time schedule or in ways we expect it to or to people we think deserve it. Or like Martha and actually Mary too, if you go back and read the the scripture, we think that, you know, the need for restoration would not have even been necessary if people had listened to us and done what we had said in the first place. We could have avoided all this mess. And each time that things don't happen the way that we think they should, or ways that we think they should be done, and problems, they seem to persist, and pain and hurt, they take over, and then we begin to doubt, can things be made better? And we let our faith be diminished so much that we relegate restoration to only being a future promise, but not a present reality. We settle for life as it is, rather than embracing the possibility of what life can be and should be because of Christ. I wonder, have you ever known anyone that you were like, yeah, they're never going to change? That's the way they are. You ever known people like that? 
They were always going to be mean or rascally or different or difficult. And, you know, you can insert all of whatever you want to describe, because I'm sure you can think of that person right now. <laughs> that will never change. But maybe one day you've come across them, and there's just something different about them. Something's changed. They seem to be transformed, a new person. You see, maybe they're not the person they once were, that I remember them by, but do you question their transformation? Maybe a little? Do you wonder, is this possible? Can this be real? Maybe you even smell the stench from the memory of their old way of living surrounding them and wonder, can new life really have come from that? Could it have? We may believe that restoration is possible, but my goodness, the smell when you open up the reality of what someone has done and the way they've lived, and it becomes nearly unbelievable sometimes. Yeah, we love stories of restoration and transformation, don't we? We love stories about people whose lives have been changed by God's power. The accounts of dramatic conversions or remarkable deliverance, they make us weep and shout all at the same time. Those who were lost but now have been found. Those who are dead in their sins but now know life in Christ. But if you only knew... The amount of conversations I have with people, many of them Christians, who can rejoice over God's transformation in someone else's life, and then not long after will claim, well, this other person I know, they can't change. They can't. They're, you know, God just can't do something about this or do something remarkable in me. I'm too set in my ways. This is the way things are. They are too far gone. They will never change. I'm just too normal for God to do anything remarkable in me. Sometimes I just want to say, didn't Jesus say that if we believe, we would see God's glory? Didn't Jesus say that? And sometimes I have to even look in a mirror myself and say to myself, didn't Jesus say that if I believe, I would see God's glory? Restoration is messy because humans are messy. We are walking contradictions of belief and doubt, of wanting miracles to be real, but letting practical considerations and excuses override our ability to imagine something any different than what is. And so often we let the stench of what is a reality in our life make us doubt what we can be because of Christ. And all the while, here's Jesus telling us, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you? Don't you know that all things are possible with God? You claim these words, but then doubt them in the same breath. And sometimes for the silliest of reasons. Restoration can be messy because we make it that. And we have to believe that the unbelievable can happen both in ourselves and in people that we love and especially the people we struggle to love. We have to get past our limits, our boundaries, the things we say are set in stone and these are never going to change. We have to trust that God can work in ways that blow our mind even, that surpass our boundaries of possibility and truly embrace the boundless hope of God's possibilities. Yes, having a very clear understanding of human behavior and the faults and failures that we often have, but trusting that God can do something about that. 
that change can happen, that transformation is possible, and that we even have a role to play in God's restoration of people and their lives. I don't know if you notice this in the scripture, but even though Jesus himself called Lazarus out of the grave by name, Lazarus come out. The scripture, the very next, the very next verse, still refers to Lazarus as the dead man. The dead man. And that's because he was still bound and covered in his grave clothes. So he was still being defined and seen by those around him as dead because he was clothed in the evidence of his death. It was not until the community around him unbound him that he was fully released to Jesus' life, to live in Jesus' life. Jesus' work of restoration was actually aided by the community who did the work of pulling off those stinky grave clothes, and trust me, they would have stunk bad, and letting Lazarus go. Let him go. In the same way, we, the church, the community of God's people, we are called to witness transformation. It's restoration of others. We witness it and we assist them even in ongoing transformation and release into life. We actually walk up to, to them we, and we rejoice with them that once who were once dead, well, now you have new life. And then we have to help them remove anything that right remind them of the life that they've been redeemed from and walk alongside of them as they go forth to live fully and freely in the new life that God has given. We embrace people who've had some sort of restoration experience, no matter how big or little that restoration may be. And we respond with amazement and a desire to hear the story Tell me about it. Tell me about what God has done. And then we encourage them to keep living this way. To live in God's love and light. Because the difference that I see in you, that's worth celebrating. And it's worth investing in to make sure that it continues. And this act of helping others in restoration not only helps their journey, but it helps us. It's a reminder to ourselves of the restoration can, that God can and does bring to us, that we too can be stripped of the clothes of sin and death and pain and doubt and fear and grief and meanness and whatever it else that we need to be redeemed from. That we too can be released, can be unbound and let go to new life because of Christ. Friends, restoration, it's possible here and now. Here and now and even into the life to come. And I know for some of us, we really need to know that hope today. That in the mess and the muck we may find ourselves in, that God's restoration, this is a gift that is given New life will emerge from the darkness of a tomb and we can bust out into the light of day and that God can do that in us. God can do it. Even today, God can do it. And if this is you, if this is you longing for that kind of restoration, I believe it can happen. And I pray over you that you will see God's glory today. That you'll see it. And for others of us that just have to be reminded that restoration is real, it is, and, and that sometimes we just have to believe yet again that it's real and it can happen even in the most unlikely of people. Who are we to complain about the bad smelling situations that others may be in, believing that it can never be different than what it is. Who are we to believe that? Who are we to keep people and even ourselves in, 
it boxed in the situations that can never be different. We think that nothing can be different. And, and we're being so practical about all the details of what is. And letting excuses for perhaps our behavior or their behavior persist. That we actually miss the opportunity for the miraculous change to happen. If we believe that we can see the glory of God at work in people and our lives and in our community, then we have to pray for it to be true and to believe that it can be true. And we look for it to be made true then too. And then we jump in at the first possible moment that this transformation begins to happen so that we can help other be for other people be free from what holds these people back and these communities back from full life in Christ. And then we also have to allow ourselves to be unbound and released to life as well. Restoration is so messy. And it can mean that, yes, we open ourselves up to some stinky situations to see it happen. But if we believe that we will see God's glory, we must live like we will. And keep our eyes open for glimpses of it in our lives and in other people and that we embrace it for what it is even when it doesn't happen how what why when where we want it to but we trust that restoration in our lives is this something that christ can do and will do now even unto the life and to come to so did i not tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory. Do you believe this? Do you believe that you will see the glory of God? Do you? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Dear Father, we do believe, and as the very honest dad who was longing for healing for his own son said to you, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help us, Lord, when we struggle, when we doubt this, when we let all these practical excuses even prevent us from seeing all the possibilities of what you can do. For you who can raise the dead to life again, truly, you can do whatever you need to do in us, no matter how big or small that may be. But we long to see your glory today, Lord. So give us a glimpse of that, we pray. Amen.